My name is Adam Shamalik. I'm a software engineer in Red Hat, but most of my work goes to Fedora. And I came to talk about things. Um, so um, let's start with question. Um, who of you is a developer? Okay, cool, we have quite a few developers. Um, so I think what you want if you're developing something besides tooling and everything, um, you need to use, you want to use as many things to make your job as easy as possible, right? So if you're writing something in Python, you won't be rewriting like Yammer parser or anything. You will just get everything from the internet. And you need as much as thing as is out there. And usually I think you would need the latest version possible because they have the big, biggest features and just like make your work really, really easy, right? And you don't really care where it comes from. It just needs to work and make your job easy. Um, and then it's ready, it goes to production, and I know it's a pilot, I couldn't find another picture. Um, system, sysadmins, operators, any of you maintaining servers um, is on call. These guys will hate you if you do that for them. So um, what they want is packages, auditability, lifecycle, support. It's a really, really different thing, right? Um, these people are really different, but they have to work together. So variety versus stability. And so how to make those two worlds connected and somehow how to fix this problem? So first question that I have, isn't this just packaging? Because that's kind of what Linux distributions do, right? Um, what is packaging actually? So it makes software um, integrated, tested, updated and easily installable. And I remember when I switched to Linux, it's 2019, so I can say 12 years ago, um, from Windows XP actually, I didn't have to, uh, really like, I didn't have to go to the internet, I just download everything I wanted to install and just search for it and it would break, but I just typed a command and it was there. For basically anything, it was a magic. And that was kind of cool. And there are people actually making sure that everything is easily installable you get the updates, it's tested, and it's integrated together, so it works in a consistent manner. Um, another thing I didn't care about is life cycles. But now that I need to run services or something, I kind of care about life cycles, because this, has, this brings an overtime stability to a diverse open source world, but what that, what that means really is, if you look at the open source project, and I don't think there are seven, there are like millions, but this is kind of, um, simplified view, and it's kind of mess, right? This is, this is a view of maintenance timeline, and they just new projects appear, disappear, new versions appear, and just like crazy. And if you need to have a lot of them on the server, how can you know that someone's actually taking care of it? So what Linux distribution do, they somehow squeeze it together, they pick the right ones, and they put them all on the same life cycle. So it's a little bit less crazy, so you know that everything is the same. Um, and they're somehow conveniently released as distribution releases, we call them, for example, Fedora 27, Fedora 28, so it has a version, so it, you kind of know what's in there, and it's consistent. Um, and of course, there are many Linux distributions out there, it's not just Fedora, so, um, for example, CentOS, it's really long time stability, or Fedora, a little bit shorter, and then we have something like Arch Linux, which basically there's no release, it's just like new features coming all the time. So you can kind of choose what you want, what's the best for you. And if you're a developer, you might choose something faster. If you're a sysadmin, you can choose something slower. It, it really depends, but, but this whole concept, I think it sounds great for operators, right? We have packages, we have life cycles, we have updates, we have everything, it's transparent. I kind of know what's in the system. That's great. But it's monolithic. And developers might be limited, or even sysadmins might be limited because a certain app is a certain version. So what to do with that? Containers, maybe. Do they make both happy? Um, Let's, let's have a look at containers then. So they are kind of isolated and portable, which is great. 
So like I have this image with raspberries. So imagine like a huge pile of raspberries. How do you move it? That's possible. But if you put it into boxes, you can kind of move it around. You can sell it quickly, um, easily. And it's great. How will that look like in a week or five? <laughs> um, containers are just isolated and portable. The thing that you sh just shove something in a container and make it run doesn't somehow magically um, make it better, right? So containers are great, but for this particular problem, they might not be the solution, at least not the first step. So what we kind of need is new versions or variety of versions for developers with the qualities required by operators. And I think that's easy to say, but let's have a look if we can somehow figure it out. And that's why we started project in Fedora called Fedora Modularity, which kind of does this thing. So let's have a look what's, what's going on in there. So modularity basically separates the life cycle of different pieces of the distribution. So we have like OS and maybe some applications. So it's kind of going back to the image with the upstreams, but not too much. And we saw this image, right? So let's have a look what's inside. Um, if I see inside, I, I'll just narrow it down to Node.js package and then not just one package, there are like tens of thousands, but I can see that, um, for example, F26, Fedora 26, shipped Node.js version 6, just one, and 27 had Node.js 8, just one. And if you need to, like, have a different version, it was kind of difficult. So what happened in Fedora 28 is that we, in the Fedora 28 server, um, we introduced modularity. And what it does is, and this is kind of high level, but we basically enable multiple streams of content to be available to the system. And we call it streams. We don't call it version because there's an important difference. You can't just go back to an old version and just like pin it in there. You still need to get updates. So these are like streams of backwards compatible updates for, for the application. And when you're ready to upgrade to a new version of the OS, you can, you can change <coughs> or you can keep the same one. It's kind of, I, it, it's independent. So you can do whatever your application needs, but you can keep the latest OS, for example. And if you're an engineer, you might see that this is kind of live. We are not trying to make binaries that just run everywhere. It's, it's mostly like this. Um, we produce actual native binaries for the OS, but in concept, they're the same thing. So in the UI, it's then easier to navigate through. All right, so before I show you a demo, um, there are like four concepts that we need to have a look at um, to understand modularity. So packages, everything in the Linux distro is a package. And we're not changing anything in there if you know Fedora, if you use Fedora or Debian or whatever. In Fedora, we don't change the packages at all. They're still in there. But what we do is we introduce this concept called module, and it's like a logical group of packages on independent life cycles. And we group them to make the navigation a little bit easier so you don't have to work on the package level and figure out which one of the tens of thousands of packages is containing your application. It's just Node.js or a database. And then we have independent life cycles. We can provide them on multiple versions that you can choose from. And if there are many versions, we also don't want to make you choose every time because that would be crazy, so we have defaults. And that means that you can only choose, you need to only choose when you really want to. So if you don't care, you don't care. Everything works as it before, but if you need to switch a version, you actually can. And then we also need to make sure that if you update the system and you say, I want Node.js 8, you don't get 10 by accident when it comes in, right? So the updates will respect your choice, and unless you change it explicitly, it will stay on the stream you chose. All right, so let's have a demo. And I really like live demos, so I don't want to ruin their reputation, so let's do a recorded demo. Um, all right, let's see how that works. So this is a Fedora command line, and I'm typing dnf module list, which is a new command to list all the modules available in the distro. And I might even, yeah. So this is a list of the modules we, there. It's, we have. It's been long, but I'm highlighting Node.js. 
Um, at the time of recording, there were two streams of Node.js, eight and ten, and I can choose which one I want. So I might eventually type a command to install it. Maybe, yeah. So I type dnf module install Node.js colon eight, and this is like well-known syntax, for example, in the container world or other places, so I'm just choosing the stream 8 here. And what happens, it just gives me the packages I need for Node.js 8. It'll download them, install them, everything works as expected. And these are packages that are the same as they were always. So I don't know if you know software collections or other technologies, I don't need to do anything. It's just like at the place as I want it. So Node-V actually gives me the version 8, so I can prove it's there. All right. I think we should switch to version 10 and see what's going to happen. No, I forgot the video. I need to demonstrate update first. So there's 8 and 10, sorry. And I can see I have no update because I installed 8. And even though it's 10 is available, I still have 8. All right, and now I make the conscious choice and I say I want 10. So I type DNF module install, not just 10. And it swaps the version and upgrades the packages to the version 10. And again, <coughs> standard packages, no magic. So if I type node-v, I will see node.js 10 installed on the system. So everything works as expected. Um, all right. There's one more thing. I haven't mentioned. And these are installation profiles. And we'll see in a minute how that works. So for example, I can make a summary. Um, so if I have these modules, I can install them in different ways. So let's highlight some database. Um, I think, yeah, MongoDB. Oh, yeah. And I can install database as a client or as a server or both. So let's install it as a server. So I type DNF module install MongoDB, the version, and slash profile. And I get the server packages. So this functionality in the UI is kind of useful if you don't want to dig into the packages and just like care about the package names and everything, you just have the application as the module and then maybe two or three profiles how you can install it, if it makes sense. So it's easier for, for people to consume. And I can just type Mongo, I think I'll do tap tap just to prove there are the binaries. I won't run anything, it's, yeah, I have the Mongo daemon. I just control tab C, so we're not wasting time. And then I can install the, uh, the client packages if I want. So I just take the same command, I just type client, and again, I don't need to care which packages get installed. It's the client profile, and a few other packages, Mongo tools and MongoDB get installed. <coughs> the internet is really slow here. Oh, it's a video, wait, okay. <laughs> Um, and there we go, and I just type mongo, tap tap, I'll see the binaries. Um, and I have like mongo tools and things. I'm not a database expert, but that thing, those things mean something to people, so that's, that's good. Um, so I just control C and I'm done. All right, so that was modularity. Um, so. I can see that I have, I have multiple versions available to the system and I can choose one that I want. Um, I can't install two at the same time because they would collide because they are at the proper place I would expect. But let's have a look at containers again. So um, I like containers. I think they're great. Um, but we should, let's, let's have a look at the, right, at, at the real benefits. So they run almost everywhere. 
That's the first. And I can do the compost and testing up front and then just deploy it in production. And actually, I can even make other people to do it for me. And then we have, we have the third party container registries full of useful software. I can just like grab a database and just deploy it on my server and it'll just run, right? That's perfectly fine. Right? Oh, no, no, okay. Um, so what kind of happens sometimes is that there are people with not good intentions, maybe, and there were some container images on Docker Hub, but any public registry could do that. They basically run fine, but they were mining cryptocurrency on your hardware, and they make quite a, bit, a lot of money. So you, you really need to know what's in the container. So, back to the true container benefits. Again, they run everywhere and I can do the compost and testing up front. So, I can build custom containers with Linux distributions and I can leverage the same benefits I have for the servers. So, I can have the packaging and lifecycle benefits and I can actually run it everywhere. So, I can just, in the Docker file, the DNF module install no JS8 or whatever. Or I can use a tool called Builder, which is a tool that <coughs> build containers um, without actually the installations for being in them, so it can just build small application containers just with the dependencies you need. And what's nice about it, if you need an update, just rebuild the container. It picks the updates automatically. You don't have to go to the upstreams and do anything. So that works quite nicely. And then when your application is in a container and you can kind of run everything in container, then there's the question, what about the OS that's below the containers? Do you actually need to care, really? Um, I, the answer is definitely yes. You, you need to care about the OS because for security, for performance, for hardware compatibility and other things. But it doesn't need to be your pet in the sense that you doesn't need to care what exactly it's installed in it or you don't have to change it. So you can use so-called immutable OS. And in Fedora, we have uh, two projects one is called Fedora Core OS and one is called Silverblue. And it's a, it's a container focused operating system. And one of the main benefits is the way it gets updated. So I, 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 I like small animations, so I'll just do another animation. Let's, let's have a look at a traditional system that has packages and I wanna do distribution upgrade or just DNF update. What happens? I update it from orange to green and I can see that it's just like modifies itself underneath itself and one by one piece it just changes, right? Which is kind of cool, but it can break and you can be in a state that's not quite good. So, but I actually don't need to care about the individual packages in them. So what Silverblue and CoreOS can do for you is they have a technology called RPM OS3 and it basically builds an image or Fedora builds an image out of RPMs and you just download the whole image on the side, just like that. And then you can just reboot the image. And if it doesn't work, you can just go back. And that's really nice on servers. For example, if you're like a remote server somewhere, you really don't want it to um, break and not boot. So this is quite handy. Or on your laptop, actually, when I use, um, I know this is a Mac, but I normally use uh, Silverblue as well. Um, and I remember when I, when I upgraded from Fedora 28 to Fedora, 20, Fedora 29, I just did it over, over lunch break. I didn't really care if it works or not because I could always go back and it worked nicely. So we can even experiment and it's kind of nice. So this is CoreOS and Silverblue and I call them fearless upgrades because you always can go back. That's the rollback. All right. So. We talked about a about few things and that was quite fast. So if you have to remember three things from all of this, I think it'll be these. So <coughs> Linux distributions and modularity and the packaging and lifecycle benefits. So I can get software really easily with some guarantees and different levels of guarantees with different OSs. Containers are just portable and isolated, but they're great and I can use distributions and modularity in containers to make them work nicely and quick um, to make them work great 
and I can run them on Corvus and Silverblue, and I can have fearless upgrades, and that's the story that we built in Fedora um, for life cycles and applications and how to make developers and operators friends. And that's all I have. Um, any questions? Yeah. So, uh, Fedora, Corvus, and Silverblue, mm -hmm. uh, why would I choose one over the other? Are they competing? Mm -hmm. So, why would I choose Silverblue or Corvus and if they are competing? No. So, they are very similar technologies. But CoreOS is focused on your server, so it's like a minimal host just to run containers. But Silverblue is a full desktop environment, so you can run containers, but you can also run flat packs, which are like containers for graphical applications. And that's basically the difference, so there's very different focus in those. Um, any other question? Yeah? Uh, if I take uh, in consideration the modules, if I uh, submit to any module stream, uh, mm -hmm. the, default application, the default packages that are there are replaced uh, by the module stream or not? All right, so that's a question. Um, if I choose to have a specific module stream, and if there are some packages that would somehow overlap with the module, what happens? And the module always wins. And that's the way how we can actually have modules even, for example, if you have third-party repos and you want to try, I don't know, a new version of GNOME, for example. And you try it on Fedora, which the GNOME is not as a module, it's just a normal packages, right? But you can actually just add the modular repo, install it if you want, and it just replaces the packages. But then you can just uninstall it again and it just gets the normal packages. So it always wins. That's how we can deliver additional versions. Yeah. Uh, this is true always for dependencies for, uh, for the stream. Because I mm -hmm. noticed that the Node.js as GCC as dependency and it's not really good to have old version of GCC uh, because you need old version of Oh it, yeah, if you notice something in the demo, I recorded it a while ago, I think it was on Fedora beta, yeah. whatever, so th there might be some packaging issues in there, but in general you shouldn't bundle like GCC or something in your module, right? Okay. If, if that happened, that was a bug and it, I, I should probably fix it for the next demo, thanks for noticing. Um, yeah? Can you have multiple installed modules alongside, like PHP, 5.6, 7.0, yeah, mm -hmm. etc. Good question. Can I, you know, can I install multiple module streams at once, like PHP 6, PHP 7? Um, no. And that's the design choice we made because we install software in the proper paths as you would normally expect. So I don't know if someone of you are familiar with a technology called software collections. These were like RPM packages that installing um, software in separate paths. So you could actually, they, would, they wouldn't conflict, but it was kind of pain to maintain and pain to use. So yeah, these are just, just the standard paths and we are not trying to re-implement this. Um, and we kind of see that the world is moving to containers Anyway, so that's, that would be the way how to run multiple versions. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, so these models, how can you compare it to YAM package groups? Or yes. Yeah, if I can compare module to YAM package groups, definitely. And so in Fedora, there were always YAM package groups, which are like also can represent an application. But what would happen if you install a package group, you install the whole thing. So that's one. And you couldn't make multiple versions available to the system. So it was just like, just grouping packages, but not adding really much benefits in there. Modules add the benefits of independent life cycles, and you can choose which stream you want. And also on the build side, which is kind of hidden for the users, but you can have one source and just build it for multiple Fedora releases, and it produces native binaries for all the releases. And then you can do even magic, like build against multiple modules. So it's just like you have like a matrix of explosion if you really want to. So there are additional benefits to that. Yeah? Yeah. And just to expand on that, mm -hmm. because it works so much like package groups, if you want to just use the RPMs, they're still there. If you want if your build script says young install, um DNA install MongoDB dash server and lists the name of the RPM, it still works because the RPM is implied module, the module will be enabled automatically, all of the dependency resolution will still happen. You don't have to use the module command to get at it. You can still use the RPM just as they always work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a great, great point. I'll just repeat it for the recording. So, yeah, the, um, if you want to just 
install a package just without caring about modules. We can just do yum install package name and it works as it would used to. It can enable the module for you and just consume the packages natively. So it basically works like groups in that regard as well. Yeah. All right. Do you know when the modules are ready for the enterprise Linux? If I know when modules are ready for enterprise Linux. So um, recently there was Red uh, Hat Enterprise Linux 8 beta out and if you look at the upstream repository, so which is like a repository with the applications, they use technology basically very similar to this. You have YAML module install something, so it looks like it's coming. Uh, I can't speculate on that, but yeah, in the beta, yeah, you can, you can see there. Any other question? <coughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming, and yeah, if you have any questions and see me on the hallway, just come and... <laughs>